Relax and listen to the voice. The Policeman A few years ago, I lived in a large apartment complex in the city. The building was 10 stories high and my apartment was on the 8th floor. It was a bad area with a lot of crime. I was planning to move out soon, so I never bothered to get to know any of my neighbors. One Friday night I came home from a hard day at work and I was feeling very tired. I got into the elevator and pressed the button for my floor. When the doors opened, there was a man standing there. He was dressed in a long overcoat and his hat was pulled down low over his eyes. Hello, I said, trying to be polite. The man didn't answer. As I got out of the elevator, he pushed past me roughly and got into the elevator and started pressing the buttons. What a jerk, I muttered to myself. I unlocked my apartment door and went inside. I went straight to the bathroom. While I was washing my hands, I happened to glance in the mirror and noticed something strange. There was a dark red stain on the sleeve of my shirt. It looked like blood. Then I remembered the rude guy who had bumped into me at the elevator. It made me feel sick. I didn't know where the blood had come from, but I had my suspicions. I immediately locked my front door, then I took a shower and threw the blood-stained shirt in the trash. Needless to say, I didn't sleep very well that night. The next day was a Saturday, and I had a date with an attractive young woman I had met. I was getting ready to leave when I heard my doorbell ring. Who could that be? I muttered in irritation. I was already late for my date and I didn't want to waste more time. Peering through the peephole, I saw a policeman standing there. What is it? I asked loudly through the door. I'm sorry to disturb you, sir, he said politely. I wanted to ask you some questions. There was a murder last night in the apartment next door to yours. I was late for my date and I didn't want to get involved. Sorry, officer. I didn't see anything. I lied. But you may be able to help us, said the policeman. Did you see anybody suspicious? Can you at least open the door to talk? I wasn't home last night. I lied again. Sorry, officer. I can't help you. All right, sir, the policeman responded. Thank you for your time. He walked off down the hallway, and I continued getting ready for my date. For the next few days, I felt very nervous. My next-door neighbor had been murdered. The neighborhood was really unsafe. I was glad I was moving out soon. I also felt very guilty about lying to the policeman. After all, I'd seen the murderer. Even though I hadn't seen his face, perhaps there was something I could have told the police that would help them catch the killer. Sometimes crimes are solved by one little detail. One morning before work, I was wondering if the police had managed to solve the case. I turned on the TV and watched the news, but they didn't mention anything about the murder. When I was leaving for work, I noticed a bad smell in the hallway. It seemed to be coming from the apartment next door to mine. I had a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. The hair on the back of my neck stood on end. I went to find the building manager and told him about the smell. When I mentioned the murder, he said there hadn't been any murder in this building. I convinced him to come back up to my floor. When he smelled the stench, he used his master key to open my neighbor's apartment. Both of us were horrified by what we found. My neighbor was on the floor, surrounded by a pool of blood. The smell was overpowering. He'd been lying there for days. The Earwig Many years ago, in Borneo, there was an English man named Clifford Macy who was young, handsome, and very vain. He fancied himself as God's gift to women and often boasted about his successes. Macy was part owner of a tobacco plantation, and his friend and business partner was another English man by the name of Leopold Warwick. 
Despite being old and fat, Warwick had a wife who was very young and very beautiful, and she was the envy of every man who set eyes on her. The three of them lived together in a big house on the plantation. Macy slept in the first bedroom, while Warwick and his wife slept in the second. It was rainy season, and there was precious little to do. Macy was bored, and he could find nothing that would keep him entertained. As time went on, he developed a passion for Warwick's wife and began to wish that he could have her for himself. He tried flirting with her, but she wouldn't have anything to do with him. One evening, when her husband was away, Macy made a pass at her, but she slapped him in the face. However, Macy was the kind of man who didn't take no for an answer. Every time she rebuffed him, he became more and more obsessed with her until he was determined to have her at any cost. Although his heart was burning with a white-hot passion, Macy had a devilish and cunning mind. He soon came up with a way to get Warwick out of the picture. In Borneo, there's a type of earwig that lives on waxy secretions. It has a special liking for the human ear. It's so small and light that it could be crawling on your face and you'd barely even feel it. If it gets into a man's ear, it creeps down the canal, unable to turn around, feeding as it goes, and causing weeks of hellish torment until... Well, I'm sure you can use your imagination. Macy paid two native men a large sum of money and instructed them to creep into Warwick's bedroom in the middle of the night and place an earwig on his pillow. He went to sleep that night with a smile on his face and dreamed about the horrible fate that was to befall his friend. The next morning when Macy came down to breakfast, Warwick seemed bright and cheerful. He watched the old man closely, looking for any signs of discomfort. Just then, Macy felt a strange tickling sensation in his own ear. When he poked his finger into his ear, he discovered that he was bleeding. Jumping up from the table with a look of horror on his face, he shrieked, The damn thing's in my ear! It appeared that the men he had paid had made a terrible mistake and during the night they had gone into the wrong room and placed the earwig in the wrong man's ear. That was the beginning of weeks of unimaginable pain and agony. There was nothing the doctor could do for him. He lay in his room, tied to the bed with his wrist lashed to the headboard to prevent him from tearing his ears off. Day and night he writhed and screamed as the earwig crept and crawled and twisted through his head, slowly driving him insane. Occasionally, when the earwig was resting, Macy could get a break from his torment, but when it woke up, he would scream and scream and scream. The pain was so unbearable that being flayed alive, burned at the stake, put on the rack, or even hanged by the neck would have been an act of mercy. Every time the doctor came to see him, Macy begged him to be put out of his misery. Then something very unexpected happened. Miraculously, the earwig crawled out of his ear. Macy had come close to the brink of death, but he had survived the torment. When he was well enough to talk, the doctor came in to see him. I suppose they're gonna call the police and have me arrested now, said Macy. No, said the doctor. They're not calling the police. Why not? Macy demanded. I suppose they're trying to avoid a scandal? No. They're taking pity on you. They know about your condition. What do you mean? Well, you see, the earwig was a female, said the doctor. And it laid eggs. The Scarecrow there was an old farmer in Arizona who owned the best farm in the area. Everyone said his crops were the best and people came from all over to buy their goods from him. Whenever people asked him how he was able to grow such good quality crops, the old farmer would say it was all down to his scarecrow. That old scarecrow was the one I have to thank, said the farmer. He makes sure no crows or critters or pests come near my crops. The old farmer had built the scarecrow himself, and it was a fearsome sight. He spent months working on it to make it as scary as possible. 
He knew how important it was to keep pests away from his crops, so he gave it enormous straw arms that stretched out about six feet and big long legs that made it as tall as a tree. But the scariest thing about this scarecrow was its head. The farmer carved it himself out of a huge pumpkin. He spent countless days and nights perfecting his design until it was perfect. The scarecrow's face and head looked so grotesque and ugly that even he was sometimes scared to look at it. But it was very effective, scaring away every rodent and bird that ventured near. The neighboring farm was owned by two young men who were brothers named Josh and Harold. They were lazy and never did much work around the farm, which resulted in their crops being bad. They were jealous of the old farmer's success and were plotting against him. If they could drive him out of business, they could take over his farm and make more money. So one night, the brothers decided to sneak onto the old farmer's land. They stole his prized scarecrow and brought it back to their own house, where they stuffed it into an old closet so nobody would ever find it. The next day, the farmer woke up to find his hideous scarecrow missing and all of his crops being eaten by rats and crows. He fell to his knees and cried, knowing that his farm would soon be out of business. Meanwhile, the brothers, Josh and Harold, were watching from their own property and couldn't help laughing out loud when they saw the old man's tears of grief. Hearing the laughter, the old farmer came over and asked them if they knew what happened to its scarecrow. The brothers looked him right in the eye and said they had no idea where his precious scarecrow might be. But you know I'll go out of business and have to sell my farm if I can't find my scarecrow, said the farmer. Josh just laughed in his face, saying, Well, that's just your tough luck, isn't it? <laughs> Sucks to be you, giggled Harold. The old farmer walked slowly back to his house, his head hanging down in defeat and depression. That night, Josh and Harold had trouble sleeping, not because they felt any remorse, but because they couldn't get the image of the Scarecrow's horrible twisted face out of their minds. They decided they would never be able to sleep as long as the ugly pumpkin head was in their house, so they got up and dragged the Scarecrow out of the closet. Harold took a baseball bat and smashed the Scarecrow's head to pieces until all that was left was little bits of pumpkin strewn around the floor. The brothers swept up the pumpkin head pieces and threw them in the trash. Then they went back to bed and were soon fast asleep, having put all thoughts of the disgusting scarecrow face out of their heads. Sometime after midnight, Josh and Harold were awoken by the sound of scratching and clawing at their bedroom door. Did you forget to put the dog out? asked Harold sleepily. We don't have a dog, stammered Josh. Suddenly the bedroom door burst open and a solitary long straw arm snaked in through the opening. Then a second arm thrashed around, followed by two long stick legs. The two brothers were frozen in fear and could only look with horror as the headless scarecrow's body rose up on its long stick legs and its long arms reached out for them in the darkness. Harold felt a cold and sinewy straw claw close around his ankle and he screamed as loud as he could. He begged his brother Josh to help him, but Josh was already running out of the bedroom. Fleeing in terror, he ran down the hallway, crashed through the front door, and out onto the moonlit road. He ran as fast as his legs could carry him, puffing and panting and screaming at the top of his voice. As he passed by his neighbor's house, he saw the old farmer standing at his gate. In the moonlight, he could see the farmer just staring at him with a strange smile on his face. Josh kept running, his bare feet slapping against the rough gravel road. He glanced back over his shoulder and saw something that scared him to his very soul. He saw the scarecrow running along the road close behind him. It was gaining on him, coming closer and closer. And that wasn't all he saw. He noticed that the scarecrow had a brand new head, and it looked an awful lot like Harold. The Brass Vase A few days ago, I received a very strange letter from my best friend Julian. Jason, I need you to do something for me tonight. 
It's very, very important that you do exactly as I ask. You're probably going to think that this is all crazy, but please just humor me. Maybe we can laugh about all this, if I ever come back. Do you remember the brass vase that I found half buried in the forest? The one with the odd markings engraved on it? I need you to go to my apartment and get it. First, I need you to get a black marker and draw two eyes on the palms of your hands. Make sure the pupils are in the middle of each palm. Then I need you to go to my apartment. Bring a bag and a candle with you. When you get to the apartment, it will be dark. Don't turn the lights on. Use the candle to light your way. When you enter my bedroom, you may hear the sound of whispering. You won't know where it's coming from. Don't let it freak you out. Just ignore it. Don't let it convince you of anything. Just remember, everything that it says is a lie. You'll find the brass vase sitting on the dresser. Make sure you pick it up with both hands at once. Make sure the eyes on both of your palms are touching the brass. If you feel something touching you, just ignore it. None of it can hurt you. None of it can hurt you. Tip the brass vase over until all the blood is drained out. Make sure you drain it until there's not even one drop left in it. Whatever you do, don't look inside of it. For God's sake, don't put your fingers inside of it. Just drop it in the bag and leave. Take it away and get rid of it. Put it somewhere no one will ever find it. I'm sorry I have to ask you to do this, Jason, but you're the only person I can trust. If I'd known then what I know now, none of this would have ever happened. If everything goes well, I'll see you soon. All of my love, Julian. It was signed in his usual flourish. I didn't know quite what to make of it. Was he joking? Was it some sort of prank? I decided to call him and find out. His phone rang a dozen times, but there was no answer, and then his answering machine kicked in. Julian here, the recorded voice said. Please leave a message. Hey Julian, I said after the beep. I know it's late, but could you give me a call? That letter you sent kind of creeped me out, and I just wanted to check that you were okay. I heard a faint muffled, Help me! I froze and almost dropped my cell phone. I yelled, Is that you? What's wrong? Help me, he said again, his voice barely above a whisper. The buzzing on the line had grown louder. I'm frightened. I'm frightened. I'm frightened. I'm frightened. The buzzing was drowning out his voice completely. Julian, I yelled, What happened? The line went dead and I stared at my phone his words echoing in my head. I tried to call him back, but the line was busy. I found a candle and a bag. I grabbed my car keys and left the house. I kept trying to call him all the way over to his apartment, but there was no answer. I parked outside, and when I got to the door of his apartment, I put the key in the lock and opened it. Inside, it was as dark as dark could be. I reached in and was about to flick the light switch on, when I remembered the instructions in his letter. Don't turn on the lights. I took out the candle instead, and after lighting it, I walked into the apartment. The flickering flame cast weird shadows all over the walls. Julian, I whispered. There was a musty smell in the air. Something felt wrong, and the closer I came to Julian's bedroom, the more wrong it felt. I put my hand on the knob and opened the door. That's when the whispering started. It was faint and it sounded like many voices, all whispering in unison. I couldn't make out what they were saying. Turn on the lights! Lights! Turn on the lights! Turn on the lights! It was very dark. Lights! Turn on the lights! Turn on the lights! Turn, turn, turn on the lights! I had to resist the urge to turn on the lights. It was very hard to resist. The brass vase was sitting on the dresser, just as Julian said it would be. It had a squat body with a long, thin neck and an opening just large enough for two fingers to fit in. I grabbed it carefully with both hands at once. It felt warm to the touch. 
All of a sudden, the candle flickered and went out. I was plunged into complete darkness. It was pitch black. The whispering began to grow louder and louder. That was when I remembered the instructions Julian had given me in his letter. The eyes on the palms of my hands. I'd forgotten to draw them. Ah, there's nothing I can do about it now, I thought. I tilted the vase, and in the darkness, I could hear the blood spilling out onto the floor. The room filled with the stench of copper. I don't know how long I stood there. Perhaps a minute. Maybe even an hour. I listened to the drip, drip, drip. And when it stopped, so did the whispering. It was deathly quiet. All of a sudden, I realized how frightened I was. A wave of maddening fear washed over me, and I just wanted to be sick. I had never been so terrified in all of my life. Dropping the vase into my bag, I left the apartment as fast as possible and went back to my car. I took out my cell phone, and with shaking hands, I called Julian again. There was no answer. All of a sudden, I felt a strange tingling in the palms of my hands. Then the whispering started again. It was all around me, surrounding me, going down inside of me. I was driving towards the bridge, intent on throwing the brass vase over the side and getting rid of it that way. The whispering told me not to. It told me to turn around and go home. I obeyed. I took the brass vase home. Each time it starts, it starts like this. First there's whispering. Sometimes it's many voices at once. Sometimes it's only one. Sometimes it sounds like my mother. Sometimes it sounds like Julian. I always understand what the voices are saying. Sometimes they say, Feed us, feed us, feed us, feed us, feed us, feed us. Sometimes they say, Turn on the lights, turn on the lights, turn on the lights. Sometimes they say other things too. Things that I don't want to repeat. The whispering gets louder and louder, and I find myself powerless to resist. I prick my finger with a knife and I hold it over the vase, squeezing the blood into its gaping mouth. This is how it feeds. I'm a prisoner of the breast vase now. Day and night, I must fill it to the brim. I'm weaker than I've ever been in my life, but I can't let it get hungry. It doesn't like it when it gets hungry. Maybe I'm just going mad. Maybe my mind snapped. That means I'm not insane, doesn't it? I mean, only a lunatic would consider himself sane. If you were sane enough to question your sanity, then you wouldn't be insane anymore, would you? The whispering has started again. The vase is almost full now. Maybe this time the blood will satisfy it. Maybe this time it won't demand any more. I made one fatal mistake. I forgot to draw the eyes on the palms of my hands. Julian, if you read this, I need to tell you something. I'm glad you're free now. I'm sorry I failed to follow your instructions. If I ever manage to escape, I'll find you, wherever you are, and maybe we can have a big laugh about how crazy all of this is. The Girl and the Doll I want to tell you a story about a girl and a doll. I know what you're thinking. You've heard this story before. A little girl wants a doll. Someone buys it for her, and then the doll goes mental and kills everyone. Well, you're wrong. This is a different kind of story. It happened back in 2009 when I was about 16 years old. One day, as I was walking home from school, I noticed that a new family had moved into the house at the end of my street. They were a young married couple, and they had a little daughter who looked like she was around, I don't know, six years old. She wore a white dress, white socks, and black shoes. Her hair was long and black, and she was holding a doll in her arms. The doll had a white dress and long black hair as well. In fact, it looked almost exactly like a miniature version of the girl. Every day on my way home from school, I saw the little girl. She was always sitting there outside of her house, 
cradling the doll in her arms and watching me as I passed by. There was something about the way she stared at me and the cold, dark look in her eyes that really unnerved me. At night, I couldn't sleep. I was plagued by very strange dreams and woke up in a cold sweat. I could only vaguely remember the dreams, but they all involved the girl with the doll. This went on night after night, and the lack of sleep left me exhausted. There was an old lady who lived next door, and she was very inquisitive. She was one of those old women who knows everything about everyone. She was always eavesdropping, sticking her nose into other people's business. One day, as I was walking to school, she grabbed me by the arm, and in hushed tones she said that she had something to tell me. She wanted to talk about the family who moved into the house at the end of the street. You don't want to mess with them, she told me. They're not good people. I've heard that they're always on the move and never stay anywhere for long. And that daughter of theirs, did you know that she's adopted? She's not right in the head either. I've heard rumors that she's the offspring of the devil, and that the doll that she carries around is not a doll at all, but a demon made in her image. I just rolled my eyes and walked away, dismissing it as the idle gossip of a crazy old woman. But oh, how silly I was. How I wish I had listened to the warnings of that crazy old woman. A few days later, there was a knock on our front door. When I answered it, a young woman was standing there. She was the mother of the little girl with the doll. Hello, she said. I'm your neighbor, and I'd like to ask you a favor. Sure, I replied. What is it? Something unexpectedly came up, she said. I have to go on an errand and my husband doesn't get home from work until later. I'll only be gone for a few hours, but I need someone to look after my daughter while I'm away. I know it's short notice, but could you take care of her? Of course, I said. What's your daughter's name? Lisa, the mother replied. We need to leave now, so if you don't mind... I followed the woman to her house, and I waited while she rushed upstairs. When she returned, she was leading the little girl by the hand. As soon as I saw her, I was taken aback. There was definitely something wrong with her. Her eyes were completely black, like the eyes of a shark, and she was still clutching that wretched doll in her arms. I don't know what it was about the doll that creeped me out so much. Perhaps it was because it looked so much like the little girl that it was disturbing and uncanny. Before I had the chance to back out, the mother said her goodbyes, then got in the car and drove away. Without a word, little Lisa reached up and took me by the hand. Her skin was ice cold to the touch, and it sent a shiver down my spine. Play with me, she said. We went upstairs to her bedroom. But as soon as I closed the door, I began to feel uneasy. I could detect a strange and unpleasant smell in the room, but I couldn't figure out what it was or where it was coming from. I played with Lisa for about 30 minutes, but then I began to feel a tightness in my chest. I broke out into a cold sweat and my stomach started to feel like it was churning. I felt like I was going to vomit. I have to go, I gasped. All of a sudden, Lisa scrambled to her feet and cried out, no, no, you're going to stay with me forever, and we'll play all the time. She stared at me with those cold black eyes, and I felt like I was going to faint. I was frightened and I wanted to get out of the room, but when I tried to open the door, the handle wouldn't turn. I began rattling it and pulling on it, but it was no use. I ran to the window and tried to open it, but it wouldn't budge. No matter what I tried, I couldn't open it. Then I remembered the warning of the old woman, and I cursed myself for not listening to her. I was trembling with fear, but I decided to recite a prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. As soon as I uttered those words, the little girl let out an ear-splitting screech. She screamed so loud that I thought I would go deaf, and I had to clasp my hands over my ears, but I never stopped reciting that prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The girl dropped the doll and it fell to the floor. All of a sudden it came to life and it came at me, gnashing its teeth and scratching with its clawed hands like a feral animal. 
I tried to kick it away, but it jumped at my neck and tried to tear my throat out. I fell backwards on the bed, desperately trying to fight the doll off. It was a terrible struggle. The doll was thrashing back and forth, scraping me and tearing at my clothes. Every time it got its hands around my neck, it started to try and throttle me. Eventually, I got the upper hand. I grabbed it by the legs and swung it with all of my might, smashing its head against the wall. It hit the wall so hard that it left a dent in the plaster. A crack split the doll's face in two, and thick black smoke began to pour out of it. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. The doll lay on the floor, shaking and wriggling, flopping back and forth like a dying fish. The doll's head split wider and smoke billowing out of it grew thicker and thicker. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. When I finished reciting the prayer, Lisa was lying in the middle of the room, unconscious, and the doll was a little more than a steaming pile of molten plastic, hissing and bubbling on the carpet. Just then, Lisa's mother came home. She ran up the stairs and burst into the room, demanding to know what had happened. I tried to explain, but I couldn't get the words out. I vomited all over the floor. When Lisa regained consciousness, she said that she remembered nothing, nothing at all. I looked at her eyes. The blackness was gone from them, and now they were bright, a bright, vibrant shade of blue. Three years later, when she was only nine years old, Lisa died suddenly. She drank an entire bottle of bleach and it corroded her insides. She died in tremendous pain, screaming and crying in agony as her organs slowly broke down and dissolved. The doctors ruled in an accident, but everybody suspected she had taken her own life. Her parents were devastated. Nobody could explain why a girl so young would do such a thing. A week after the funeral, her mother and father moved out of the house. It held too many bad memories for them. As they were going through Lisa's bedroom and packing up her belongings, they found something glued to the back of her mirror. It was a photo of Lisa and the doll. On the other side, written in the scrawl of a child, was this message. She has returned to us, for those who answer our call will be damned to serve us forever. Babysitting When I dropped out of school, it wasn't easy to find work. Nobody seemed to want to hire someone with no qualifications. I was tired of applying for jobs advertised in newspapers and on the internet without receiving any replies. One day, I spotted an ad for a job that was not so tempting, but I really needed the money. The ad said they were looking for a live-in babysitter to take care of three young children. It said no qualifications necessary. They just required someone young, responsible, and attractive. I called the number and the phone was answered by a woman with a sweet and friendly voice. When I told her I was calling about the babysitting job, she hired me on the spot. She didn't even want to meet me in person first, but she said that she needed me to start immediately. I was delighted. The next morning I drove over to the house to meet the family. As soon as I got there, I saw that the house was beautiful both inside and out. You could tell that the family was wealthy. The woman and her husband greeted me with broad smiles on their faces and introduced me to their children. There were two boys and a girl. Sebastian was six years old, Damien was five, and Lanka was four. The kids seemed to be nice, happy, and friendly. They were always polite, they never fought with each other, and they never made a mess. All they did was play alone or read a book. The parents announced that they were going out to dinner and wouldn't be home until late that night. They told me that the children had already been fed, so all I had to do was to get them ready for bed. The mother gave me a phone number and told me to call her if there was an emergency. The father told me to make myself at home, and if I was hungry, he said I could take whatever I wanted from the refrigerator. After their parents left, the children sat down on the sofa to watch TV. They were very quiet and barely said a word. During one of the commercials, I was feeling a bit hungry, so I went into the kitchen to make myself a snack. 
As I was rummaging around in the refrigerator, I couldn't help but notice two large jars that were stuffed in the back of the fridge. Both of them were wrapped in plain brown paper and had a rubber band sealing the rim. I wondered what on earth could be inside of them. My curiosity got the better of me, so I took one of the jars and peeled back the brown paper to take a little peek. It was full of long strips of fatty meat floating in a murky red liquid. I couldn't tell what kind of meat it was, but it didn't look like pork or beef to me. Just as I was about to put the jar back where I found it, I heard a noise behind me. It startled me so much I banged my head on the shelf above me. When I turned around, Sebastian was standing in the doorway staring at me. Put that back, he said. That's not for you. The look in his eyes and the tone of his voice sent chills down my spine. Sorry, I muttered. I was just looking for something to eat. Sebastian didn't reply. He just stood there staring at me. I placed the jar back in the refrigerator and shut the door. Sebastian turned around and went back into the living room, and I lost my appetite, so I went and joined the children in the living room and watched cartoons with them. I was trying not to let my imagination get the better of me when the cartoons finished and the news came on. There was a story about a teenage girl who had gone missing. The police found her decomposing head in a dumpster. They said that they had no idea what had happened to the rest of her. I was afraid the grisly news story would upset the children, so I changed the channel and told them that it was time for bed. The kids didn't complain. They just walked up the stairs in single file and went to their bedroom. I put them in their pajamas and got them ready for bed. Then I tucked them in, told them all good night, and switched out the lights. When I went back downstairs, I was bored and had absolutely nothing to do, so I decided to watch a movie. I looked through the family's DVD collection, but all they had were cartoons and Disney movies. I wasn't in the mood for any more kid stuff. On the bottom shelf, I spotted some old VHS tapes. One of them had a strange title. It was called M Girls. This seemed rather curious, so I decided to take a look at it. I put the videotape in the VCR and pressed play. Then I sat down on the sofa and made myself comfortable while the video started. The first thing I noticed was that it was a home video. The family must have recorded it themselves. The parents and the children were all laughing and looking like they were having fun. I was about to turn it off when I happened to notice someone else in the video. It was a girl who looked like she was in her late teens. It seemed like she might have been the previous babysitter. She looked very familiar. It seemed like I recognized her from somewhere. Perhaps she went to my school. Then it finally hit me. Oh my freaking god, I thought. It was the missing girl from the news report. My hands were shaking. My whole body was trembling. I just wanted to get out of there as fast as possible. I jumped out of my seat, ejected the video, and put it back in its case. Then I remembered the jars in the refrigerator. I had to see what was in those jars. With a shudder, I went to the kitchen and opened the refrigerator. Maybe I'm just overreacting, I thought. I reached and took out the second jar. Peeling back the brown paper wrapper, I could see long, pale hunks of meat and strips of fat floating in the red liquid. Some of the meat looked like it had skin on it. Human skin. I could also see what looked like strands of hair. Long hair. Human hair. I was so scared I felt like I was about to pee my pants. I ripped off the rubber band that was sealing the jar and I peered inside of it. There was an eyeball staring back at me. This horrified me and I dropped the jar and it smashed on the kitchen floor. I ran into the living room, put on my jacket, grabbed the videotape and stuffed it into my pocket. When I came out to the hallway, Sebastian was standing at the foot of the stairs. Where are you going? he asked. I... I just remembered. I forgot something. I have to go home and get it. I'll be back in a few minutes. Damien and Lega came running down the stairs. You can't go, screeched Damien. You can't leave us on our own. I'm calling our parents shouted Lenka as she picked up the phone and began dialing numbers. Sebastian grabbed a hold of my leg and wouldn't let go. 
you have to stay, he squealed. We're hungry. His grip was extremely tight, but I managed to shake him off and ran out the front door. As I dashed to my car, I saw the parents pulling into the driveway. I didn't stop for a moment. I just jumped into my car and locked all the doors. The children were on the doorstep, screaming and crying. The mother and father got out of their car and they came running over. There was an angry look on their faces. What's wrong? They shouted. Where are you going? Come back here. I didn't answer them. I didn't even look at them. I just turned the key into the ignition and revved the engine. They both started banging on the windows. I floored the accelerator and I tore out of there like a bat out of hell and I never looked back. I didn't stop until I came to the police station. I told the police officers everything I knew and handed over the videotape as evidence. The police immediately dispatched two patrol cars. By the time they arrived at the house, the parents and children were gone. They just took their car and they disappeared. The police searched the house and found the jars in the refrigerator. They also found human flesh and bones in the basement. They did tests and they confirmed that these were the remains of the missing girl. They never managed to track down the parents of the children. They're still out there somewhere, probably living under a different name, probably still on the hunt for new victims. If you want my advice, be careful who you're babysitting for. The Manhole One morning, a young Japanese girl named Mai was walking to school. On the way, she happened to see another girl playing at the end of the street. For some strange reason, the girl was jumping up and down. Mai knew that the girl must be attending the same school as her because they were both wearing the same school uniform. When Mai got closer, she saw that the girl was jumping up and down on a manhole cover. Mai was puzzled. She wondered what the girl was doing. Why was she jumping up and down on the same spot like that? Was she insane? Was it some kind of game? As she was jumping, Mai heard the girl muttering these words to herself. Three, 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 three. As Mai passed by, she recognized the girl. It was Haruka, a quiet and strange girl in her class who was often the target of bullying. Sometimes the other girls in the class would just ignore Haruka. At other times, they would play cruel pranks on her. The teachers knew that she was being bullied, but they just turned a blind eye and didn't bother getting involved. Realizing that school was starting in a few minutes, Mai hurried off, leaving the strange girl to her odd game. That day in class, Mai noticed that there was an empty desk. Haruka hadn't showed up for school. All day long, Mai wondered what the girl was up to. When the school bell rang, all the kids streamed out onto the street. Mai walked home, and on the way she came across Haruka again. The girl was still in the same spot she had been that morning. She was still jumping up and down. Mai walked up to the girl and stopped right in front of her. The girl just kept on jumping as if Mai wasn't even there. She had a big smile on her face and she was saying the words, Nine, 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 nine. What are you doing? asked Mai. Haruka didn't answer and just went on saying, Nine, 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 nine. I asked what you're doing, shouted Mai. The girl just ignored her and kept jumping up and down. Mai didn't particularly like or dislike the girl. She remembered calling the girl some cruel names in the past and bullying her along with the other classmates. Who do you think you are? Mai shouted. Answer me when I talk to you. Until that moment, Mai had never hated Haruka like the others did. But the sight of the girl enjoying herself so much and ignoring her so completely filled Mai with anger. You better tell me what you're doing or you'll be sorry, warned Mai. The girl just went on jumping happily, as if she hadn't even heard Mai's warning. Suddenly, Mai lost her temper and pushed Haruka to the ground. My turn, said Mai, as she took the girl's place and stood on the manhole. Mai jumped up in the air 
and at that exact moment, Haruka reached out and removed the manhole cover. Mai fell straight down. The strange girl got to her feet and replaced the manhole cover. Then, with a big smile of satisfaction on her face, she started jumping up and down again. And as she jumped, she said, Ten! 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 Creature in the Village My name is Martin, and I'm 26 years old. I worked in an office in the city. On the weekends, I used to love to get away from all the hustle and bustle and take a trip to the countryside. Luckily, I have a cottage in a small village, which is located right at the edge of the forest. How I used to love to get out of the city and spend a weekend in my little cottage. Why did I stop loving that? Well, I'll tell you. After a hard week at work, I needed the rest, so I decided to get out of town. I went home, I packed my bags, threw them in the trunk, and I drove off. When I arrived in the village, it was late in the evening, and I was tired from the long drive. I went straight to bed and fell asleep pretty quickly. In the middle of the night, I was awakened by the sound of my car alarm going off. I looked out the window, but there was nobody in sight. I found my car keys and I pressed the button to shut off the alarm. When the awful noise stopped, I lay down again and tried to fall back asleep. All of a sudden, the alarm went off again. I didn't feel like getting up, so I just grabbed my keys and I pressed the button again. Everything was peaceful and quiet. Five minutes later, the alarm went off a third time. Once or twice could have been an accident, but now I was wondering what was going on. Could somebody be playing tricks on me in the middle of the night? I got up again and I pressed the button to turn off the alarm, but this time I didn't lay down. I stood there at the curtains and watched. After a few minutes, I saw something by the light of the moon. A shadow emerged from the bushes and slowly approached my car. I could just about make out the shape. It was something tall, skinny, and blackish. The figure reached out with its long, thin arms and knocked on the car. The alarm went off again, and quick as a flash, the dark figure retreated back into the bushes. At that moment, I realized what was going on, and I began shaking with fear. I turned off the alarm and continued to watch. The thing emerged from the bushes again, and it slid silently over to the gate. It threw a hand through them and removed the partition holding the gates closed. I was paralyzed with fear and I couldn't move. My mind was overcome by panic thoughts. What was that? What is that thing? What does it want from me? What in the hell is it doing? Will it ever go away? A shiver ran through my body, from my head down to my toes. My mouth was dry and my heart was beating so fast. I was so tense. I was gritting my teeth and clenching my hands into fists. I gained control of myself and ran down the stairs as fast as my legs would carry me to the ground floor. I wanted to look for something I could use to protect myself. However, just as I was about to switch on the lights, I suddenly froze in my tracks. The dark figure was at the window. It was pressed up against the glass, staring in, looking to see whether or not there was someone home. I immediately ducked down behind the sofa and peered out. That's when I realized what all these tricks with the car were for. It was trying to lure its victim outside. I couldn't take my eyes off of its hideous face. The skin was the color of ash and it was covered with wrinkles. Its eyes were small and beady and completely black. Instead of a nose there were two ragged holes. It didn't have any lips just two rows of sharp yellow teeth. Its breathing was so heavy and so hoarse that it was misting up the window. I just knew it wasn't going to go away. After standing at the window for a few moments, I heard a rustling noise as it came to the front door. I watched as it tried to push its fingers through the gap under the door. The handle began to twitch wildly up and down, and then the creature emitted a chilling sound. It was not like the human voice. It was a deep, beastly growl, like an angry dog chewing on a bone. 
I knew that if it heard me, it would keep trying until it found a way to get into the house. So I just sat there crouched down by in the sofa, hiding in the shadows and desperately trying not to make a sound. Tears began involuntarily streaming down my face. No matter how much I tried to stop them, I couldn't. I could feel my pulse pounding in my temples, and I was shaking like a leaf, just waiting for it to end. I don't know how long I cowered there. I must have passed out. When I woke up and looked at the door, the creature was gone. The door was still in place and everything seemed secure. I had never been so relieved in all my life. I ran upstairs and looked out the window. It was light outside and there was no sign of anything wrong. I decided to take a chance. I grabbed my keys and without stopping to collect any of my things, I ran out to my car. I jumped into it, I locked the doors, and I drove away from the village as fast as I could. I didn't stop driving once until I got back to the city. When I got back to my apartment, I turned on the radio and heard a news report. The announcer said that, in the village, dead bodies of two girls had been discovered. The corpses had been mutilated and dumped in a swamp. I can only guess that the creature finally found what it was looking for. The Red Death There was a prince named Prospero who lived in a huge castle in the mountains. His servants and courtiers attended to his every whim. The castle had high stone walls and was surrounded by a deep moat. At the entrance, there were giant iron gates and an enormous portcullis over the door. The prince heard rumors that there was a terrible plague sweeping across the land. They called it the Red Death. The disease was highly contagious, and whole towns had been wiped out in a single night. Those who were infected suffered from sudden dizziness, and sharp pains in their skin broke out into a red rash. Then, within minutes, blood would start pouring from their eyes, their nose, and their mouth, until they collapsed, writhing around in unbearable pain, and then finally dying. As the plague drew nearer, the prince invited a hundred of his friends to take refuge in his castle and keep him company. He locked the gates, barred the windows, and lowered the portcullis to keep everyone out. Inside, the prince and his guests laughed and danced and made merry, while outside the walls, the poor people suffered and died as the Red Death raged on. To keep his guests entertained, Prince Prospero decided to hold a masquerade ball. He ordered his servants to redecorate seven rooms, especially for the ball. The first room was painted blue, from floor to ceiling. The second was pink, the third was green, the fourth orange, and the fifth was white, and the sixth was purple. The seventh room was completely black. The walls and ceilings were painted black. The carpet on the floor was black. The curtains that hung from the walls were made of black satin. All of the furniture was upholstered in black velvet. On one of the walls there was a large black clock with a pendulum that swung slowly to and fro making a loud and monotonous ticking sound. Every hour the clock would strike, giving a series of loud clangs like the tolling of a bell. None of the rooms had any lights. In each room the only illumination came from a blazing fire in the fireplace that cast flickering shadows across the walls. In the seventh room, the firelight cast such strange and frightening shadows on the walls that very few of the guests were brave enough to set foot inside of it. The masquerade ball began in the blue room, and the guests were all having fun. Everyone was wearing a mask. The musicians played merry songs while the guests danced. They ate the food and drank the wine that had been laid out on the tables for them. Whenever the clock struck the hour, the musicians would stop playing, the guests would stop dancing, and everyone would stand and listen to the dull clanging chime. When the echo of the tolling bell had died away, the guests would move on to the next room, and the revelry would begin again. As the night wore on, they moved from the blue room to the pink room, to the green room, to the orange room, to the white room, and to the purple room, until they found themselves entering the black room. At midnight, the clock began to strike twelve, and everyone stopped to listen. As the chimes subsided, 
the guests became aware of a masked figure standing in the middle of the room. None of the guests had noticed him before. The stranger was tall and gaunt. He was dressed in a dark red cape and his face was covered by a red mask in the shape of a skull. When Prince Prospero caught sight of the figure standing among the guests, he shuddered with anger. Who are you? he demanded hoarsely. How dare you insult me by coming here without an invitation? Leave my castle this minute, or I will have you killed. The masked figure made no move to leave. Instead, he stood there, staring at the prince. Just then, an unearthly red light illuminated the black room, and the guests became so frightened that they were shaking in their boots. Prince Prospero did not like to be disobeyed. He drew his sword and held it up. Leave now or I shall slay you myself, he shouted. The masked figure slowly walked towards the prince and all the guests drew back, too afraid to stop him. Standing in front of Prince Prospero, the figure reached up with bony hands and took off his mask. The prince let out a sharp cry and dropped his sword. The guests screamed in horror. Behind the mask, there was no face at all, just an empty, black void. All of a sudden, Prince Prospero grew dizzy, and he felt sharp pains in his sides. His skin broke out into a red rash, and blood started pouring from his eyes, his nose, and his mouth. His guests collapsed around him, writhing in agony, and their screams echoed through the seven rooms. The Red Death had come like a thief in the night, and one by one, the prince and his guests succumbed to the terrible disease. The clock stopped ticking. The fires went out, and darkness and decay and the Red Death triumphed over all. Gone Fishing This morning, bright and early, my friend Oleg and I decided to go fishing. We live in a very small town, and there's never much to do. We were dying of boredom. However, this morning, it was even quite more quiet than usual. The streets were empty and there was nobody around. The town was eerily quiet. We went down an overgrown path that led to the river. When we got there, we saw a strange figure in a dark green hood crouching on the riverbank. He was holding a fishing rod in his hand. Good morning, I called out. Are the fish biting today? The man didn't answer. He just gave a hoarse laugh and started to sway slightly from side to side. I got a little closer to him and asked again, Are the fish biting? I took two more steps and then stopped in my tracks. The man began to sway faster and faster. I couldn't see his face because it was obscured by the hood. Just then, I saw something that horrified me. At his feet, there was a human hand, severed off at the wrist. I felt a chill run down my spine and I started to back away. The man slowly turned his head to face me. I saw a pair of piercing red eyes and sharp dark yellow teeth. Instead of a nose, he just had two triangular holes. He stared directly at me and he opened his mouth in a bloody grin. I turned and ran back to Oleg. Not knowing what I had seen, he looked at me in bewilderment. I glanced behind me. The man in the hood was standing up and coming towards us. Without waiting to see what would happen next, I grabbed Oleg by the hand and I dragged him with me, shouting, RUN! RUN! We rushed into the trees, looking back over our shoulders every five seconds to make sure the man wasn't following us. We sprinted through the undergrowth and made our way to the police station. On the way, I told Oleg in a trembling voice about the severed hand and the man's terrifying face. He was very scared too. When we reached the police station, I pulled on the door handle, but it was locked. We both pounded on the glass, but there was no answer. Listen, I'm going to see if I can get inside, I said. You stay here and keep watch in case that crazy guy comes. Oleg was shaking and said, But I'm scared. What am I going to do if he... I didn't even let him finish. I ran around the corner and found an open window at the back of the building. I climbed up through it and found myself in the bathroom of the police station. When I opened the door, I peered out and saw a dark corridor. One of the lights was flickering ominously. 
I summoned up all of my courage, walked down the hallway, and came to an office. The room was empty and there were papers and furniture strewn across the floor. The phone was broken into pieces and the desk had been overturned. Just then, I heard someone shouting. It was coming from the street and it sounded like Oleg. I was about to rush to the front door and let him in when I heard a rustling sound. Suddenly another door in the corridor opened and I saw a figure lurking in the darkness. Who's there? I demanded. There was no response, but I saw two familiar red eyes peering at me from the darkness. I froze in horror. For a moment, I was so petrified that I couldn't move. The figure emerged from the darkness and stepped into the dim, flickering light. It was the same face I had seen at the river, but he was wearing different clothes. This time he was wearing a policeman's uniform. Suddenly, the man came towards me at lightning speed. He covered a distance of like three meters in less than a second, and he grabbed me by the throat with his strong, bony hand. He stuck out a black tongue, licking his lips and gnashing his crooked teeth. As I watched in horror, his face started shifting and changing right before my eyes. Without even thinking, I reached out and I grabbed the first thing I could find. It was a pen. I raised it above my head, and with all my might, I brought it down into the man's neck. Bright red blood gushed from the wound and the man let out a high-pitched screech. He loosened his grip on my neck and I managed to break free. I rushed down the hallway and yanked open the first door that I saw. Inside there was a pile of human flesh and knobbed bones. The sight made my stomach turn and a wave of nausea overcame me. I fell to my knees and I threw up on the ground. I was shaking with fear. I realized that this was the remains of the other policemen. Just at that point, I remembered Oleg, who was waiting outside for me. I ran to the front door and I opened it. When I saw the familiar face of Oleg on the other side, I wanted to cry. Is everything okay? I asked. I heard you shouting. Oleg nodded. Everything's fine, he said. I thought I saw someone moving around inside. Let's go home before that crazy guy comes back. We ran all the way home, and when we reached Oleg's house, we found that his parents were not there. On the table there was a note. Gone to visit your grandmother. We'll be back late tonight, the note read. We went around the empty house, securing all the windows and locking all the doors. We were barricading ourselves inside. Oleg was surprisingly calm. My hands were shaking so much I could barely hold on to anything. After we finished securing the house, I picked up the phone to try and get help, but there was no dial tone. We were cut off from the rest of the world. We sat down in the living room and turned on the TV. There was nothing on the news. Everything was going on as usual. Whatever was happening, it seemed to be just confined to our little town. I took out a pen and a sheet of paper and I tried to write down exactly what had happened to us. I don't know why, but somehow this made me feel better. If we don't make it through this, then at least someone will find this piece of paper and know what had happened to us. Oleg's sitting beside me right now, but he's strangely pale. I asked him if he's okay, but he just shrugged his shoulders. Something is wrong. He got up and went to the toilet. He's in there now. All of a sudden, a wild fear seized me. Maybe it's just my paranoia going out of control. I shivered from head to toe and I looked at the pen in my hands. That cannot be, flashed through my head. Trying to speak very loudly but calmly, I asked Oleg, By the way, where's your sister? Did she go with your parents? I heard his voice from the bathroom saying, Probably. As the realization slowly sunk in, a cold wave of horror washed over me and I put my head in my hands. I started to cry. Oleg doesn't have a sister. In the uneasy silence, I began to hear the bathroom door opening with an ominous creak. The Laughing Man There was a doctor who worked in a remote village in Africa. 
He was the only white person for miles, and he had spent half his life taking care of the local villagers, providing them with medical care and medicine. One day, another white man stumbled into the village. He could barely walk, but he was laughing like a maniac. <laughs> His clothes were tattered and torn, and his hands and knees were covered in blood. His eyes were wild, and he looked exhausted. It seemed like he was out of his mind. The doctor gave him some water and tended to his wounds, but the man could not stop laughing. The doctor gave him a sedative and put him to bed so he could get some rest. The man slept for hours, and when he woke up, the doctor gave him some food and tried to find out how he had come to be there. What happened to you? The doctor asked, What are you doing all alone out here in the jungle? I wasn't alone, the laughing man replied. I came with my partner, Jack Hunter. We were on an expedition to find the legendary Waki. That's what the locals call them, a rare species of ape. The Africans say that they're intelligent apes, almost as intelligent as a human, maybe even more intelligent. (laughs) We wanted to capture one and bring it back to civilization to put it on display. The plan was supposed to make us very rich. We tried to hire a guide to take us into the Valley of the Apes, but none of the locals dared to go there. They were afraid of the apes. (laughs) We weren't going to let that... We weren't going to let that stop us, so we bought a canoe and headed down the river on our own. (laughs) When we came to the Valley of the Apes, we made a camp. Hunter unpacked the traps and set them up in a clearing in the jungle. We hid in the bushes and watched those traps for three whole days, but we caught nothing. (laughs) The apes were too smart for us. They knew what we were up to. They weren't going to fall for some simple traps. Hunter had a better idea. We dug a pit in the clearing. It was about ten feet deep, and we filled that with sharp wooden spikes. Then, then we covered it all over with branches and leaves, and we went back to our camp to wait. We didn't have to wait very long. In the middle of the night, we heard a loud scream, a horrible gurgling animal scream. We rushed out to check on the pit and we found a dead ape impaled on the sharp wooden spikes. We dragged the corpse out and laid it on the ground. We had what we had come for, a dead ape, and I wanted to go home. Hunter had other ideas though. He wanted to capture a live one. I tried to talk him out of it, but there was no reasoning with him. Nothing I could say would dissuade him. He took a knife out and started skinning the ape's body. As he worked, I nervously watched the jungle around us. It was dark, but I could feel the eyes of the other apes watching us. (laughs) I couldn't shake the creeping fear that they knew we had killed one of them and the rest would come and take revenge. When Hunter finished skinning that ape, he put the skin on and wore it like a costume. (laughs) We removed the sharp wooden spikes from the pit we placed a big log across it. Disguised in his ape costume, Hunter balanced on the log and I covered the pit up with branches and leaves again. His plan... (laughs) His plan was to trick one of the other apes into coming closer so it would fall into the trap. He crouched there on the log and waited while... (laughs) He waited while I went back to our camp. It was almost dawn and I was just about to doze off when I heard the scream. I I rushed out to check the pit, but it was empty, and my friend Hunter was nowhere to be seen. I called out his name, but there was no reply. I searched for hours, but I couldn't find any trace of him. I was about to give up hope, and then I spotted a figure out in the jungle. It was Hunter. He was crouched down under a tree, He was naked as the day he was born, and he was just staring at me with a blank look on his face. Hunter, I cried. Good Lord, what happened to you? I thought you were dead. I asked him why he didn't answer me. He didn't even say a word. Slowly, he just rose to his feet, and he stood there staring at me. And then, (laughs) 
then, <laughs> then, then he took it off. <laughs> then, he, then he took it off. The man was shaking and laughing so much he could barely control himself. His body was racked by spasms of madness. What do you mean? The doctor asked. What did he take off? Giggling like a maniac, the man struggled to finish his story. <laughs> he, he took it off. <laughs> the ape, the ape took off Hunter's skin. <laughs> Bouquet of Flowers There was a woman named Mary who worked as a technical support specialist in a call center. It was very busy and the phones were ringing off the hook. She was having trouble keeping up with the huge number of calls. Shortly after lunch, Mary answered the phone and there was a very angry customer on the other end. He said that he'd been waiting on hold for almost 45 minutes. She apologized for keeping him waiting, but the man was very agitated and didn't want to listen to her excuses. When she was not able to find a solution to his problem immediately, he became even more upset. She put him on hold, and when she came back, he became very hostile towards her. Mary asked him to remain calm and assured him that she would fix his problem as soon as she possibly could. No matter what she said, it just seemed to make him more and more angry. He was literally shouting at her, ranting and raving about how she was wasting his precious time and he was complaining about how much money the phone call was costing him. Eventually, the irate customer began cursing and swearing at her and Mary was forced to hang up on him. An hour later, he called back. His attitude was even worse. He flew into a rage and demanded to know why she had hung up the phone. When he started using foul language again, Mary slammed down the receiver. At the end of the day, the man called back again. This time he had calmed down and seemed embarrassed. He apologized for his rude behavior and asked her name, telling her he wanted to send her something to make up for it. Oh, you don't need to do that, said Mary. No, no, I really want to, replied the man. Just a little present to show how sorry I am. We're not actually supposed to give out our names, she said warily. Give me your first name then, he said. Well, okay, my name is Mary, she replied. Sure enough, when Mary arrived at work the next morning, there was a lavish bouquet of flowers sitting on her desk. There was a card with the flowers that had her name on it. Mary was delighted. Nobody had ever sent her flowers before. At the end of the day, when her shift ended, Mary said goodbye to her co-workers, picked up the bouquet of flowers, and walked out to the car park. She wanted to get the flowers home quickly so she could put them in a vase. As she was about to get into her car, she turned around and saw a small, balding, middle-aged man walking towards her. Suddenly, he pulled out a gun and pointed it at her. Nobody hangs up on me, he shouted, and then he pulled the trigger. Mary was shot four times and died on the way to the hospital. The police tracked down the man who shot her and arrested him. It turned out that he was indeed the angry customer. He had absolutely no intentions of apologizing to Mary. He had sent the bouquet of flowers just in order to identify her when she carried them outside. Blood stains. After the murders, the house had lain empty for two whole years. The newspapers were full of sickening details about the brutal crime, and whenever prospective buyers heard what had happened behind those gray concrete walls, they stayed well away. Then one day, a young married couple named Mr. and Mrs. Griffin came to view the house. They liked the look of it, and the price was very low, 
so they decided to buy it. Before they moved in, they had some workmen come and clean the bloodstains off the walls and the bathtub and the kitchen sink. They had to install new carpeting to cover the stubborn bloodstains on the floorboards, and even after airing the house out for a week, there was still an odd smell that lingered in the hall closet. The Griffins thought that it was best to avoid telling their children about the grim history of their new home. There was no sense in needlessly upsetting the little ones, and it might cause them some sleepless nights. For the first few days after they moved in, things went splendidly. The children had a party and invited all their friends from school. Mr. and Mrs. Griffin went around and met their new neighbors. It seemed like they were all settling in nicely. One night, as they were getting ready for bed, Mrs. Griffin was in a thoughtful mood. Did you know that one of Mr. Bentley's hands was found in the kitchen? She asked. Oh, her husband said. Really? Yes, but her fingers were in the dining room. Oh, how ghastly, replied her husband. I wouldn't mind if he had used a gun, she said. But the way he carried it out, bits here and bits there, well, he made a mess of the whole house. It wasn't all his doing, said her husband. If Mrs. Bentley hadn't insisted on dragging herself around from room to room trying to escape. Well, she wouldn't have had to drag herself if he hadn't chopped off her legs, said his wife. I suppose you're right, dear, Mr. Griffin replied. Do you think we should invite the Talbot sisters over for dinner tomorrow? Oh, those two are a pair of old gossips, said the wife. The only reason they'll be coming is to see if we manage to get rid of all the stains. He didn't plan any of it in advance, you see, said her husband. How was he supposed to know that her sister would drop by unexpectedly? And of course, when the mailman came by to deliver the letters and saw what was going on, well, obviously, he had to go too. It was rather a mess, said Mrs. Griffin. I think I'll take a bath before bed. In the bath where he chopped off her legs? asked her husband. Yeah, that bathtub, she replied. The downstairs bathtub looks a bit too dirty. Well, in that case, I'll just pop into the bathroom while you're getting ready, he said. Mr. Griffin was shaving himself in the bathroom when he suddenly felt very strange. Staring at himself in the mirror, he knew there was something wrong. He just didn't feel himself. And then, as he stared at his reflection, an odd sensation came over him. It was as if his mind was somehow clouded, and he wasn't quite in control of his own actions. He quietly opened the bathroom door, walked silently down the hallway, and tiptoed up the stairs to the attic. When he got there, he opened a small cupboard and saw it sitting there in the corner. He had no idea how, but he knew that it would be there. The axe. Mrs. Griffin was sitting in the front of the bedroom mirror, putting up her hair, when she noticed her husband coming into the room. His hands were behind his back, almost as if he was hiding something, and there was a curious look on his face. What are you thinking, dear? She asked. I'm thinking I won't make such a mess this time. The Human Chair Hello everyone. What you're about to hear will shock you. I need to confess the strange and terrible crime I committed, and I can't bear to keep my secret any longer. I beg you not to stop listening. For years I've hidden myself away from the world. You see, I'm hideously ugly. Too ugly to describe, really. You'd be shocked and horrified at the sight of my face. I was a miserable and wretched creature because I never knew love. I never felt the affectionate touch of a hand or the warm feeling of a pair of lips brushing against mine. I was a carpenter by trade and I worked all day in a factory making furniture. My specialty is making chairs. 
My skilled hands carved the wood, screwed the pieces together, fashioned the backrests and armrests, and did the upholstery. I patted the cushions, and I sewed the covers. As I worked, I felt like an artist creating a great masterpiece. When all my chairs were finished, I would always test them out to make sure they were comfortable. It gave me a great thrill to imagine all the different people who would sit on the chair that I created. All those people, unlike me, who had wonderful, happy lives. Those people who probably had someone they loved, and someone who would love them back. Every time I thought of them, I felt nothing but misery and despair. One day, I was designing a new type of chair, and as I worked, a very strange idea began to take form in my mind. I changed the design, and I made a hollow space inside. It was a cavity large enough to fit a human body. Of course, I had to take out a lot of the wooden framework and the springs inside of it. The knees would be just below the seat. The head and the upper body would be inside of the backrest. Someone could sit inside the chair, and no one would ever know they were there. I left a small little space for supplies like food and drinks, and I even included a little potty for pee and poop. By the time I was finished, the chair had become a miniature little home. I stripped off my clothes and I climbed inside the chair. Can you imagine how strange that felt? It was a pretty tight fit, but I managed to get used to it after a while. I was in there in the complete darkness, but I could hear what was going on around me. I heard my colleagues walking around the factory looking for me. They had no idea that I was right under their noses. After a while, some delivery men loaded me into a truck and transported me to a furniture store. They put me on display in the middle of the shop floor and left me there. I was perfectly concealed, and nobody was any of the wiser. I was like a crab or a turtle, but instead of a shell, I had my chair. Almost as soon as I arrived, customers started testing out the chair. I can't even tell you how many unknown bottoms sat down on me. Some of them had big fat bottoms like a jellyfish, and others had thin bony bottoms like a skeleton. Some had firm buttocks like a horse, and others had chubby buttocks bouncing up and down on me like a rubber ball. It was an amazing feeling. I could feel the warmth of their flesh through the material. Their shoulders rested against my chest and their arms and hands rested on mine. Not one of them suspected that the soft cushion they were sitting on was actually little old me. Previously, because of my grotesque and disturbing appearance, people had always recoiled at the sight of me, but now my skin was virtually touching theirs through a layer of cloth. Hidden inside this chair, I imagined myself hugging them, kissing them, and wrapping my arms around them in a passionate embrace. Of course, it was a strange sort of existence. After spending so long inside the chair, sitting in the same position, my muscles started to wither away. I could barely move and my body was crooked and bent. I was folded up like a contortionist, but really I didn't care. All I could think about was the exquisite feeling of having people sit on me. One day somebody came in and bought my chair. The delivery men picked me up, put me in the back of a van, and brought me to the home of a nice family. They put me in their living room facing the TV. Within days, every member of the family had sat on me at least once. I was in heaven. But there was one member of the family I loved more than all the others. This person was very special to me, and as time went on, I began to fall in love with them. I couldn't help myself. Whenever they sat down on me, I tried to make my knees as comfortable as possible for them. Whenever they leaned back on me, I would embrace them more warmly and make them nice and snug. And when they felt tired, I would move my knees back and forth, gently rocking them to sleep. You might think I was mad, but I was madly in love with this person. Actually, I became obsessed with them, and I longed for them to return my feelings. I reached the point where I felt that if they only knew I was there, they would fall in love with me too. This person loved to read, so I came up with a cunning plan. I wrote down my story and submitted it to a website that they frequented. By now, you probably guessed who I'm talking about. That's right. It's you. I've been in your home for so long, 
You've probably forgotten where I came from. Every night, I crawl out of the chair and I sneak upstairs and I watch you sleep. I can't bear to be away from you for a moment. I love you, and I think that you could love me too, if only you saw me. Now, after you finish reading this, please turn around and look at me. I'll be waiting. Don't be afraid. Come and sit down on my knees. I miss you. The Drinking Water There was a little girl who lived in an apartment building. One day, she told her mother she was going out to play with her friends. Hours later, when the girl's mother went down to call her in for dinner, she realized that her daughter was nowhere to be found. The mother asked all the kids who lived in the apartment building if they had seen her daughter. All the kids told her that they hadn't seen the little girl all day. An awful realization sank in. The little girl was missing. The girl's parents called the police and the search of the surrounding area was launched. All the other parents in the apartment building joined in the search, but it was fruitless. In the end, the little girl was never found. Three months later, the residents of the apartment complex began to complain about their drinking water supply. Whenever they turned on the water taps in their apartments, they noticed a strange odor. Gradually, the apartment manager started to receive more and more complaints from the residents about the taste and smell of their water. He decided that something had to be done, and he told the janitor that that's the water in the storage tanks on the roof. The janitor went up to the roof and began removing the lids from the tanks and checking the chemical content of the water. When he got to the very last tank, he lifted the lid, and he was hit with an overpowering stench. Gazing down into the murky depths, he was able to make out something floating in the water. It was the decomposing body of a child. After the police conducted an autopsy, they were able to confirm that it was the corpse of the little girl who had gone missing three months before. Seems that she had been playing on the roof when the lid of the water storage tank was temporarily removed. Apparently, she looked into the tank and must have accidentally fallen into the water and drowned. The girl's corpse lay there, undisturbed, for three whole months. And for three whole months, the inhabitants of the apartment had unknowingly been drinking the water that the little girl's decomposing corpse was floating in. The Old Man The old man lived all alone in an ancient, crumbling house near the sea. His garden was overgrown and neglected, and his house was surrounded by old, gnarled trees. He was a recluse, and rarely ventured out of his home. No one knew his name or where he came from. Those who saw him said he had long black hair, a wrinkled, leathery face, and dark, piercing eyes. Sometimes, neighbors would see him hobbling around on a cane. The old man was rumored to be both extremely rich and extremely feeble. There were rumors that he kept a fortune in gold hidden away somewhere in his dusty home. Young boys loved to taunt the old man, shouting at him and calling him names whenever they passed his house. Sometimes, they would even throw rocks at his house and break the window panes of his dwelling. Occasionally, some of the older kids would steal up to the house and peer in through the dusty windows just to catch a glimpse of him. One night, three criminals decided to rob the old man. They parked their car outside his house and sat there in the darkness, waiting until the time was right. Their plan was to threaten the old man and make him tell them where his fortune was hidden. If that didn't work, then they would beat it out of him. The moon was shining down on the ancient house, and the wind was blowing through the branches of the old gnarled trees. When the lights in the house went off, two of the criminals got out of the car and made their way up to the front door. 
They put on black masks to cover their faces and rang the doorbell. The third criminal sat in the car, waiting nervously for his companions to return. He kept checking his watch and wondering what was taking them so long. Just after midnight, he heard hideous screams coming from inside the ancient house. He hoped they didn't beat the old man to death. If he died before he could reveal where his treasure was hidden, he would have to search the whole house from top to bottom, and that could take all night. Just then, he heard footsteps coming down the path and the sound of someone opening the lock on the gate. In the dim glow of the street lights, he strained his eyes to see, but when he looked, he didn't see what he had expected. The next morning, an abandoned car was found parked outside the old man's house. The police checked the license plates and discovered that it had been stolen. They returned the car to its rightful owner. A few days later, three unidentified bodies washed up on the beach. The corpses were horribly mangled and mutilated. Every single bone in the bodies had been broken and their heads were crushed beyond recognition. The three bodies had been reduced to little more than three rubbery piles of flesh. The discovery of the bodies on the beach caused a lot of excitement in the little seaside town. That summer, it was all anyone could talk about, and nobody could figure out who they were or what had happened to them. Still, whenever people passed by the old man's house, they felt a little involuntary shiver of fear run down their spines. Young boys didn't shout at the old man or call him names anymore, and nobody dared to sneak up to his house and peer in his windows for fear of what they might see. Hello again, constant listeners. We hope that you've enjoyed this collection of scary short stories. Stay tuned, there's more to come. It's a big, dark, scary world out there, and there are so many tales to be told. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Share this channel with your friends. Until we see you again, sweet dreams.